That makes sense, doesn't it? Prayer is like drinking water. We need to do it all the time. Goes along great with what we're going to be talking about today. The title of my sermon is coming up on the big screen in just a minute. It is, what time is prayer? What time is prayer? I'll I'll tell you what that means in just a little bit. You'll, You'll get it. First, let me remind you, since we weren't here last week to hear about it, what God wants from us. His people at Abundant Life this year, 2022. You know, well, let, let's, let's remember this first, and then I got something I want to talk to you about, about this focus. Too many Christians today see themselves as individuals living for God. But God doesn't want us to live as isolated Christians. That's not the way God made us. Remember, it's not about you. It's all about Him. And we need to be living the way He's called us to live, not the way we think is going to be best for us. And God wants us as Christians to unify with other Christians in a local church so that we can help each other out, give each other encouragement and hope, lift each other up, hold each other accountable. God wants to use you to build his house. And that's our focus for 2022. Here's the scripture God gave us to go along with that focus. 1 Peter 2.5 says, And now you have become living, building stones for God's use in building His house. What's more, you are His holy priests. So come to Him. You who are acceptable to Him because of Jesus Christ and offer those things that please God. Him. Remember, it's not about you. It's all about pleasing God. So so many Christians don't quite grasp this concept. So many people I talk to talk about their idea of Christianity. And what they think is the best way for them to live a Christian life. And they don't base it on what God wants. They don't base it on what the Bible says. They base it on some kind of logic they have come up with. And this is what I want to talk to you about for just a minute. I bring these focuses to you because I seek God all year long and ask Him what it is that He wants me to convey to you. Me, as the pastor of Abundant Life, that He placed here, the Bible says He placed me here, because it says He put all leaders in their places. And to tell you that God called here to this church. Because Jesus said no one can come to the Father unless he calls them. So he called you to be a part of this local church. He called me to be the pastor. And so I ask him, what is it you want me to convey to them? What message? And every year God has been so faithful to give me the message that he wants to give to you. It helps me all through the year to build on that message from January 1st to December 31st. This year, build his house is our focus. And you see the scripture that we have up on the screen. 
These are not things that I just come up with because I think it's a good idea. Or things that I think will be a good idea to spend time on. I truly believe that God puts these things in my heart, in my mind, because it is what he wants his people at Abundant Life to learn. Please understand that every time you listen to one of the sermons. This is what God wants you to learn. And if God thinks it's important enough for us to take the time to hear, it should be important enough to each one of us to take it to heart and to live it in our lives. So when I say things like I do every week, like this is why you need to be in church every time the doors are open, because God wants to use you as the building materials to build his house, I'm not just saying that because it's a fun thing to say. I'm not just saying that to try to make people feel guilty. In fact, that's the last thing I want to do. If you are convicted, it needs to be the Holy Spirit that is convicting you, not Pastor Michael. A friend of mine once asked me why I use so many scriptures in my sermons. So many pastors don't use this many scriptures. And I explained that I could not care less if anybody ever remembers a word I say. What I want them to remember is what God says. And I know if I'm using God's word, that's God speaking. Not Pastor Michael, not my interpretation. It's right there in black and white. And you can read it for yourself. I have encouraged and can, will continue as long as I stand behind a pulpit to encourage people to not believe what I say just because I say it. Check it out for yourself. That's why I give you so many scriptures, so that you can look them up yourself if you disagree. If you don't believe it is important to be faithful to a local church, you better have more scriptures than I do. Or when you stand before God's judgment throne, you better be prepared with an answer because God is going to ask you why when I sing you to a church whose pastor was saying you need to be faithful to a local church, did you decide to do your own thing? Go your own way. Not do what my word says. How will you answer God? And this is one example, of course, of many, many that God conveys through his word and through my mouth as an instrument of God, which is all I am, all I ever want to be. I'm not looking for any praise or glory. There's not much of that that comes with a job like this. Don't care. I want God to get the glory. And the truth is, God can't use us if we are not willing to live the way he wants us to live. If we have decided we're going to do things our own way, regardless of what the pastor preaches, regardless of what the Bible says, God really can't do much with us. But he wants to use us as his building materials to build his house. As you see, Peter wrote, in the New Testament. 
We're of no use to God. We're of no use to anybody if we're off doing our own thing instead of helping the rest of our church. We need to learn to live for God in His way. We need to learn to live for others before we live for ourselves. And the way we're going to build God's house this year is by sharing our faith with everybody we can, leading people into a relationship with Jesus that we already have, and then bringing them into church so that they can learn how to live a Christian life and how to share their faith with others. And they can lead others to Christ and bring them in. You see how quickly the church can fill up if we do this. With people who are committed to what we have made a commitment to. Building God's house. It only takes us going out and doing what God has called us to do. Sharing our faith. And if we will commit to doing that this year, our church will be a completely different church by next year. You believe it? Okay, so when we were together last time, a couple of weeks ago, we started talking about five things that we need to make sure we train every new Christian that we are bringing into a relationship with Jesus and into the church to put into their lives to keep the devil from stealing that seed that was planted in them. Because... Jesus even warned us that the devil will do that. That if the seed that is planted by God's word doesn't take root, the devil will come right along and steal it. And the person will be worse off than they were before they heard. Here are the five things we have found that we need to make sure every new Christian puts into their lives. Number uh, one, the Bible. Number two, prayer. Number three, worship. Number four, fellowship. And number five, witnessing. These are the five ways that we grow as Christians. And the sooner we get these things into the lives of our new baby Christians, the sooner they become the mature Christian God wants them to be. We've already talked about the Bible, and we talked last time about prayer. But I found uh, it was difficult for me to move on yet from prayer. There's so much to prayer. Last time we talked about how we need to make sure that we allow God's Holy Spirit to pray for us and how the Bible showed us how to do that. But I want to talk to you one more time today about prayer, a little bit different aspect of prayer, Uh, the importance that prayer plays in the lives of new Christians. You know, as Christians, we talk a lot about prayer. I mean, think about it. We say grace over our meals. We say bedtime prayers. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord, my soul to keep. We talk a lot about praying. Of course, we pray at church. Some people, that's the only prayer they get all week. That's not good. It's not the way it should be. And those people really don't have effective prayer lives. What do we really know about effective prayers? Praying in a way that is really effective. Today I want to talk about prayer that really works. And that is what we need to be teaching our new baby Christians. And it's what we need to know ourselves. See what the Bible has to say about it. Prayer that really works. James chapter 5 says, Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call 
the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. You know, James says some pretty matter-of-fact things about prayer in this passage. I love the way James wrote. He was straightforward. He did not beat around the bush. He said things the way they are. James, remember, was the, the pastor of the very first Christian church in Jerusalem. James was also the brother of Jesus, Mary and Joseph's kid. He was Jesus' kid brother. So when we read what James has to say, I really think we need to pay attention because this is a guy who must know what prayer, effective prayer, is really like. The person God chose not only to be the brother of Jesus here on earth and grow up with Jesus, but the first pastor, maybe not the first. I think Peter was the first. But he was the pastor of the very first Christian church in Jerusalem after Jesus died and was resurrected. This guy knows what he's talking about. And it's why he could write so matter-of-factly about things. Because he knew in his heart what was right, what was true. We need to pay attention to what he's trying to teach us about prayer. Did you notice when he said we are supposed to pray? That's what I want to talk to you about today. What time is prayer? When? And James says we should pray when there is, and here's your first fill in the blank on the app or in your handout from your bulletin. When should we pray? We should pray when there is trouble. When there is trouble. James does not mix words here. Anyone who is in trouble should pray. Let's read that again from James' own words. James 5.13. Is any one of you in trouble? Have you ever been in trouble before? Some of us a little more than others. James says, if you're in trouble, you should pray. Pretty good advice. And honestly, this is one idea that most of us don't really have a problem with. Because when we get into trouble, we do pray, don't we? Well, at least once the trouble gets bad enough. See, the truth is, most of us, maybe all of us, usually try to solve our own problems without involving God. Until things get so bad... (laughs) They get beyond our ability to do anything, to fix them. A lot of times it's then that we cry out to God because, well, honestly, because we've messed everything up so bad, we can't figure out how to fix it now. Psalm 34, 19 tells us, disciples so often get into trouble. Still, God is there every day time. Just because you are a Christian does not mean you won't have trouble. Just because you're a Christian does not mean you won't have trouble. Does mean you won't. 
There's too many negatives in that. I'm not sure if I said that right. As the psalmist says, disciples, so often, <laughs> so often get into trouble. Even Christians get themselves into trouble. And fortunately, we serve a God who can handle anything we get ourselves into. But we really need to learn to pray as soon as the trouble starts. Not try to fix it ourselves, not try to get it out of it, not try to make our own way through it. God is willing, and honestly, He's more capable of handling any problem we have in our lives than we are by far, right? You agree with that? How many of you think you can handle things better than God? That's what I thought. So why is it that we wait? Why is it we try to fix things ourselves? We need to realize that we need God's help. Even in the, the small troubles that come into our lives. A lot of times we're like this this story I heard about this little boy. And his pastor was talking to him and he told his pastor, Pastor, I say my prayers every night before I go to sleep. And the pastor wanting to, as most pastors do, teach him a little bit more, asked him, well, what about in the morning? Do you say your prayers then? Little boy thought about it for a minute, and he said, oh, no, I don't, I, I don't say my prayers in the morning. And the pastor said, why not? He said, well, because I ain't scared in the daytime. <laughs> that is so often what Christians are like. We'll go to God when things get so bad we can't handle them. But until it gets to that point, we figure, ah, I'm a smart person. I got some wisdom. I'll figure this out. God is always ready to help. But he will never interfere where he's not invited. So we need to learn to invite God to get involved in our lives, especially when we have trouble. Psalm 34, 6 says, I was a nobody, but I prayed, and the Lord saved me from all my troubles. Even if you feel like you're a nobody, even if you feel like your trouble is a little thing that you don't really need to bug God with, get that thought out of your head. Learn to take every problem to him even if you think you can solve it yourself if you have trouble don't wait until you've exhausted all other options before you turn to God just pray that's what James says Are you in trouble pray let's make that a focus of our prayers this week so that we remind ourselves how important this is Monday and Tuesday when you are in your devoted time to God Ask God to remind you to pray as soon as you have trouble. Not wait until it gets bad. Let God have it. What's the second thing James told us? To pray when there is happiness. Pray when there is happiness. When you're happy, James says, sing your prayers of praise to God. Well, let's look again at what James actually said instead of my paraphrase. James 5.13, is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. What a wonderful bit of advice. Don't just pray when things are bad, when you have trouble. Have you ever had a friend that you only talked to, they only came and talked to you when they wanted something from you? I think we've all had friends like that. 
You knew when they needed money because you'd get a phone call or a text. It's the only time you'd hear from them. You're like, oh, I know what he wants. Well, a lot of people treat God the same way. When they're in trouble, when they need something from God, then they're on their knees. James said, are you happy? Take that to God too. God wants to hear from us when we're happy as well as when we're in trouble. Hebrews 13, 15 says, So through Jesus, we should never stop offering our sacrifice to God. And that sacrifice is our praise coming from lips that speak his name. William Barclay, one of my favorite Bible commentators, wrote, The ancient peoples sometimes argued that a thank offering was more acceptable to God than a sin offering. For when a man offered a sin offering, he was trying to get something for himself. That is forgiveness, right? While a thank offering was the unconditional offering of a grateful heart. The sacrifice of gratitude is one that all may and should bring. We need to tell God of our happiness in the same way that we come to Him when we're in trouble. Tell Him how pleased you are with everything He's done for you. That's what worship is for realizing who God is and who we are in comparison with Him. Like that scripture we just read, Psalm 34, 6, I was a nobody. We are nobodies in comparison to God. And yet, He wants us to come to Him when we're in trouble and when we're happy. And He wants us to praise Him for what He does for us, his unworthy people. Philippians 4.4 4 reminds us, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Prayers of happiness are often called rejoicing in the Bible. And we're instructed over and over again through the Bible to pray these prayers of happiness. All the time. Here, take a look at this. Enter his presence. Let the distractions fade away. And worship him. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Psalm 9-2 Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Psalm 96-2 By mercy we come. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his. Praise his holy name. Psalm 34. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Psalm 105.2. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Psalm 113.1. Open your heart to the Lord. Let His presence fill you. Worship Him. 
Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. Psalm 47, 6. As a fragrant Let them praise your great and awesome name. Psalm 99, 3. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Psalm 103, 1. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. Psalm 134, 2. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Psalm 40, 4. The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be God, my Savior. Psalm 18, 46. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Psalm 139, 14. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. Psalm 86, 12. Powerful. This is how we should be giving God our prayers when we're happy. Amen. Let's focus on this this week as well, Wednesday and Thursday. While you're praying, ask God to help you rejoice when you're happy. Not forget about Him until you have trouble, but rejoice. And let's look at the last point for today. Pray when there is, number three, illness. Pray when there is illness. James says we should pray for healing whenever illness happens. Let's read that again from James chapter 5. He says, is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. That's a pretty good promise. God is the ultimate physician. I mean, think about this. God made our bodies. He made them to work the way that they do. So when something goes wrong and we have an illness, God can fix that. He can heal. Why not ask him to heal us every time we're sick? We need to give God the opportunity to heal by praying and asking him for his help. Remember, God's never going to invade you. He's never going to go where he's not invited. We need to ask. And the Bible says, if we will, God will answer. He promises to answer that prayer. There's a whole lot more to this healing thing than we really have time to get into this morning. Like how sometimes healing happens immediately. And miraculously, and how sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer and a, and a lot of prayer. Maybe we can talk about these things some Sunday morning soon, but we believe in healing here at Abundant Life. Anyway, God sees fit to do it. We don't put God in a little box and say, God... The Bible says if we would pray, you would heal us, and we prayed, and the person isn't healed. You lied. Notice James doesn't say it'll happen instantaneously. He just says God will heal. We believe that here. And when we pray for healing for someone, as a church, as leaders of this church, we believe God answers that prayer. 
Sometimes he does it immediately and miraculously. That happened two weeks ago here. We prayed for a young lady at the altar after service, and she was healed. Praise God. We believe it. We, we know that God does that sometimes. Sometimes God heals through doctors and medicine. Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. And you remember that Good Samaritan helped the man who had been robbed, beaten, by anointing him with oil and taking him to an inn where he could rest. God provides healing oftentimes through that anointing, through that medicine. We don't pretend to be wise enough to tell God how he should heal. Sometimes... God's answer is, wait until you get to heaven. As many of you know, I have a very rare disease of my central nervous system. It's a lot like MS, but it's more rare. And uh, I won't even tell you the name. It's a long, big, long, ugly name about that, that long. And it was so rare that when I was diagnosed with this in 2012, which was about... 20 years after it started, <laughs> there were only about a thousand people in the world who had ever been diagnosed with this disease. That's how rare it is. And I have prayed, and I have had leaders of the church, elders pray over me and anoint me with oil. And God has not chosen to heal me of this yet. And I have people who every once in a while come to me and say, how can you believe in prayer? How can you believe in healing when you haven't been healed? My answer is always the same. I believe God is going to heal me. It could be in this life or the next one. But I believe I will be healed. If God chooses not to heal me while I'm here, in this life on earth, I know that I have a new body waiting for me in heaven that it will not have this disease nor any other. So I still believe in the great physician who heals when we ask. I leave the method to him. But the Bible instructs us, when you're sick, ask for prayer. So if you have an illness, please have the leaders of our church anoint you with oil and pray over you. That's how you get God involved in your healing, by obeying what the Bible tells you to do. But I need you to understand something. This passage, where James talks about healing, we stopped here. Prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. But James doesn't stop there. See, James is talking about more than physical healing. Let's, let's keep reading and see what else James is talking about. He says, next, if he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, and as we always say, anytime you see the word therefore in the Bible, you need to look to see what it's there for. All of the stuff leading up to this, where it's talking about, if you're in trouble, pray. If you're happy, sing songs of praise. If you are sick, call the leaders of the church, have them anoint you with oil, and the prayer will heal, will heal you, and if you have sinned, you will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other. And pray for each other. Why? So that you may be 
healed. So that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective, James reminds us. See, there are some healing that takes more than just praying for yourself in the privacy of your own home in your time with God. Sometimes you need to involve other Christians, like when you're sick. Or sometimes sin gets so embedded in your heart and in your life, bad habits that you just can't seem to give up. And you ask God to forgive you, and he does every time. But you keep going back to him. You keep doing these things that you know God is not pleased with. And you keep inviting that sin back inside. And you keep coming back to God and saying, God, I'm sorry. Please take it away. Help me not to do it again. And then you do it again. And sometimes that sin gets so embedded in our lives that the only way to get it out is to confess it to other Christians, to Christian leaders, so that you may be healed. And of course, when in that confession, what is not written but is understood is that you will then get advice from the Christian leaders in how to overcome this sin that you have in your life. You will get counsel. You will get accountability. And if you will allow it, and if you will listen to their advice, and if you will put it into action, They will help you get rid of this sin once and for all and be healed. See, this is where a lot of Christians decide their own direction and say, "Mm, I'm not confessing anything to anybody. I'll just pray myself. I'll just go to God, and I can figure this out. And Between me and God, we'll, we'll get this taken care of. You've now decided you're wiser than God. That you have a way to do things that is better than what God told you to do. I can promise you, you don't have a better way than God's. And if you want to be healed of that thing that you just can't seem to get rid of, you need to follow the instructions of Scripture. Proverbs 28.13 tells us, Whoever hides their sins will not be successful. But whoever confesses their sins, and stops doing wrong, will receive mercy. Sometimes there are sins that plague us, habits that we can't seem to shake, attitudes or emotions that we can't seem to change. Oh, we try. Try to get rid of that anger ourselves. We try to keep it under control, and then something happens and just sets us off. And we say things that hurt people, and we do things that we shouldn't do. And we feel guilty, and we feel bad, and we go to God and say, God, please forgive me, but that, that guilt doesn't seem to go away because we know that is still inside of us. Confess your sins. Listen to the advice of Christian leaders. If you want to be healed of these things for good, you need to confess them to a mature Christian who will help you, will pray for your healing, will give you advice 
and will hold you accountable. This is another reason to be faithful to a local church. See, we need each other. There are things that you cannot do alone. It's just the way God designed us. Don't ever be too embarrassed to ask for prayer from your Christian family for healing from anything, including bad habits. Believe me when I tell you, the Christian leader that you go to to confess has their own things they have to confess. We're no different than you. Just that we've already gone through what you're going through now. We've matured a little bit more. And we are here to help you. Friday and Saturday this week, ask God to help you confess so you can be healed. As the worship team comes forward and we conclude this service for today, I just want to say, so we, we've learned now what kinds of things we should pray about. What time is prayer? Well, it's when these things happen. But a question I want to ask you is, what happens when you pray? The Bible says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Do you feel like this righteous person that James talks about? Do you feel like your prayers are powerful and effective? And if not, how do we get to that point? How do we get to the place where we're the person James is talking about? The righteous person whose prayers are powerful and effective. Well, you got to become righteous. What does that mean? I looked up the word righteous in Danker's New, Text, uh, New Testament lexicon. And here is the definition that Danker's gives. Righteous means observing divine laws, upright, virtuous, Keeping the commands of God, this term is used of him whose way of thinking, feeling, and acting is wholly conformed to the will of God, and who therefore needs no rectification in the heart or life. Wow. How do you stack up against that definition? Whew, that's a tough one. So upright and virtuous that your way of thinking, feeling, and acting is wholly conformed to God's will. That you don't need anything else because you've got it all. Whew. I don't know about you, but that makes me feel like I'm not quite there. Fortunately, God made a way for us to become righteous like this definition describes Look at 2 Corinthians 5.21 where it says, God made him who had no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us. When he went on the cross, God took all of the sins of all of humanity from the start to the end and put them on Jesus. He became our sin on that cross and he took them to death. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
You can become righteous by allowing Jesus to live in and through you. God wants more of a relationship with you than just when you come to ask him for things. Let him live inside. Let him take control of your thoughts, of your attitudes, of your actions, of your very heart. And then your prayers will become powerful and effective too. Let's stand. And let's say a prayer in closing that God would help us to become these righteous people because Jesus has made it possible if we allow him to take control of our lives. And so that God would help us to allow his Holy Spirit, Jesus' Spirit, to take over. Remember, he won't force you. Every choice you make, every second of every day, defines whether or not Jesus is in control. Or whether you have taken back control from him, which he will let you do. It's our choice every time. Let's say that prayer for every person in here. God, we need your help. God, we, we definitely want our prayers to be righteous and effective. God, we see how far we are from being righteous. Help us, God, that when trouble happens, we come to you immediately. Not wait, not try to take care of it ourselves, but come to you with everything because you're in control. And so automatically when trouble happens, you're there to take it, and we just let you take the reins. God, help us to remember when we're happy, when everything is going well, to give you praise, to sing praises to you, to give you thanks. And God, help us every time an illness happens to immediately hand that to you, to ask for prayer, and God, to go to the elders, ask them to anoint us with oil, to pray for us when we are sick. And especially, God, when that illness is more than just a physical illness, when it's something in our spirits that we can't seem to let go of, things that are hurting our lives, that are destroying us from the inside. God, Give us the wisdom to just hand everything to you and to let you take control of our lives so that we can be your righteousness and our prayers will be powerful and effective. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.